everyone and welcome to a new video. The other day I was rewatching Ever After, you know, iconic childhood film, to try and motivate myself to keep working on my breathe dress. It is slow going. <laughs> anyway, while watching the film, I sort of fell in love with all of the costumes in it. Again, I just love it. <laughs> I feel like they're all super wearable. I don't know, casual daytime renaissance, you know. Basically, I thought it'd be fun to talk through them with you guys and research a little more into the time period. This is obviously not a period piece that is aiming for historical accuracy. I discussed in my Bridgerton video that I usually don't look for historical accuracy in films I watch and enjoy, not only because I think that the whole concept of historical accuracy is nearly impossible, but because I like the opportunity to be creative with costumes and make them work for the story and the characters. Controversial opinion, this is why I like the 2019 Little Women. Don't come at me. Ever After, A Cinderella Story came out in 1998. This is clearly intended as a new, more modern version of the Cinderella fairy tale. The Cinderella story is thought to be millennia old, with versions of the story appearing in ancient Greek stories and at several different points in time all over the world. An Italian version from 1634 called La Gatta Cinderdola, translated as the hearth cat, seems to have been the basis for this version, popularized by Charles Perrault and the Brothers Grimm. Perrault's version, Perrault, 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 Perrault's version is credited with introducing the pumpkin, the fairy godmother and the glass slippers, all iconic in Disney's 1950s animated film. Although there is no pumpkin in Ever After, the setting of the film may be a reference in the 17th century Italian version. The film is clearly set in an imagined classic Ren Fair, vaguely medieval fantasy setting. We know and love this setting. It is possible to roughly date the film since it decided to include famous real people into whom Danielle keeps accidentally running into. <laughs> like you do. Wikipedia lists the film as starting in 1503 when Danielle is nine years old. The main action of the film takes place 10 years later, when Danielle is 19, and so supposedly in 1513. The only thing that makes this timeline murky is that when Danielle is 9, her father gives her a copy of Utopia by Thomas More, which is pretty essential to her upbringing, both for informing her ideals and in being a keepsake from her father. However, Utopia actually wasn't polished until 1513 and Leonardo da Vinci actually only went to France in 1516. I don't know about you, but these things are close enough together for me to forgive them a few years, like, it doesn't matter. I'm not sure where Wikipedia got 1503 from. I think it might be from the novel version, which sets the main action in 1512, but it's clear they fudged the dates a little to have both Utopia and da Vinci around. Totally fine. But not to mention that Henry II, who I assume they were going for with Henry, was only born in 1519. There are lots of anachronistic comments which are used for funny punchlines. <laughs> anyway, we're looking at 1500s to 1520 for this film. It's not trying to be an accurate representation of the time. Instead, it's trying to evoke a time period of the 16th century in the classically recognized other old timey way for film audiences. Let's keep in mind the target demographic of the film. It is not historians. And that is absolutely fine, which is why I would say, as I was the target audience when I watched it, that I found the film to be highly successful in creating a historical atmosphere. So now that we have a vague setting, let's look into the costumes. Now I've already set out that I am a Ren Fair medieval fantasy aficionado, so I'm obviously biased here. I love this look, historically inspired, romantic, almost like pre-Raphaelite vibes just centuries later anyway. There isn't an excessive amount of costume changes. Uh, I'm going to be focusing on Danielle's because... However, I haven't really gone much into this time period before. So to help us with some context and knowledge, I talked to my friend Marty of Scraps and Sequins. Hey Marty, uh, so let's talk about Danielle's dresses. And so Danielle wears six dresses, I believe, throughout the whole of the film. Well, something I do appreciate is that they do seem to repeat uh, some of her costumes. Um, so like she wears the work, work dress several times across the film. Should we open with the work dress then, which is the first one that we see in the film? Yes, I think we should. <laughs> 
I honestly really like her work dress. It's probably the most like practical out of all of them mm-hmm. while still like if you would have replaced the fabrics in her work dress, it would have been a very high class garment. But they like made it out of linen, which was totally a thing that they did. And so it's a very working class garment. Yeah, and I, I noticed as well, I was trying to, I was zooming in on the screenshots and I was like, where's the weave? What is this? And I also <laughs> thought it looked like linen. And I was just thinking about how sort of scruffy it is because it mm-hmm. does look like she's been, you know, like in the first scene when she's using I really like that when in the first scene she's using her apron to like carry the apples that she just gathered, which I think you know is so like countryside aesthetic. Um, yeah, also real living. <laughs> <laughs> the amount of things I have like carried in aprons or my skirt, so when I'm like yeah. forgot my basket at an event, is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. It's like making use of clothes as like bits that are around your body and that can be useful for your day to day life. Mm-hmm. And I really liked the fact that her blue dress was quite dirty. <laughs> yeah, it definitely like fit with the character. Like I like, I really like the opening, like when you first see it, because it's like instant, like, oh, this is the character. Yeah. Um, and that's when you know that like it's good costuming and it just kind of like sets up the rest of the film for like, this is going to be great. And it's so great. I love how they use time period to like show emotion. Yes. Anyway, we can talk about that later. Okay, yeah, let's come <laughs> back to that because I want to hear more about that. <laughs> um, I think I should just quickly give a disclaimer that uh, we're not here to look at historical accuracy in the terms of patrolling it. We're just, mm-hmm. we like the film, we like the costumes, and we just wanted to talk a little bit about the influences behind these costumes and also like where they work uh, in terms of the setting, the environment, the character, not as in like, it must be this scene. This is meant to be like yeah. 16th century, so it has to be this scene. We're not here for that. I think I love the costumes. I assume you love the costumes. Oh, um, I have like built an entire wardrobe off of this time period, so. <laughs> so I was thinking about, um, there's a bit in the film when she, you know, when she goes to the painter's workshop and she undresses to change. And you can see the layers. I was really interested in this because I don't know if those layers are accurate, but one of the things I've really struggled when I've been making like curtains and stuff is the Mm -hmm. lack of (laughs) support, (laughs) let's say. (laughs) The lack of structure (laughs) in these kinds of curtains. And in her dress, it's like a fitted uh, like like yours, like a fitted uh, bodice. Yeah, should we show my bodice? Yes, please. Are we going to get demonetized because my boobs are out? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, let's... Wow. So this bodice actually is not constructed what I would consider correctly. Okay. Um, Like, the arm size are, like, way too big. They need to be, like, two and a half inches. Anyway, I can nitpick this (laughs) bodice all day. But, yeah, so there's two ways to make a supportive bodice or supportive kirtle. One is to have it be very fitted on what we would consider, like, the bra band area. Mm -hmm. Um, And then also have the point from, like, here. So, like, the side seam to the shoulder needs to be very fitted. Like, you can see I can, like, barely get my finger underneath there. Yeah. Um, and that's those are the two points that you want fitted because that, the band will give you your support and then the fit on the strap is what gives you your lift. Yeah. Um, the way this one is constructed is it literally just, like, squishes everything. It's like double layering a sports bra. Yeah, well, I thought it was really cool because in the film, she's got an under vest sort of situation. So she's got, like... Yeah. Uh, It's literally like just a short vest, but it seems to be made of something sturdier. And I was wondering, do you know if that was an actual thing? Um, I don't know if it's an actual thing. I do know that like in the reenacting community, Mm -hmm. especially when you get into like supportive curdles and things, there are women who have different under curdles or like supportive curdles in different sizes for their different weight fluctuations. Ah. So that way they can like put that on and get the support that they need. Um, and then they put their dresses over top and it's just, vi- it, it just lays so nicely. It's so smooth. It's like putting on a good pair of stays, only it's a supportive kirtle. 
Um, and it's been really interesting to like see how people have been like circumventing, like, how do you handle weight change and how do you handle this and that? Um, and there are definitely a lot of people that wear like a supportive undergirdle um, underneath their dresses. Right. But yeah, I do not know like the actual historical accuracy of that. Um, but I do know that it's a really common thing in like the reenactor world. So I don't see why it wouldn't have been a thing mm. historically. But I think it makes sense in the film as well, just for, you know, a bit more comfort, because I imagine, mm -hmm. you know, most actresses aren't used to having to do away with their normal undergarments. So it might have been nice to have that as a sort of comfort. Yeah, so the other layer in that dress is a chemise. We love chemises! <laughs> Woo! I love shifts. I'm always talking about <laughs> like... them. About the Should dress? I date this dress? Oh, yes, do. Okay. Um, and I actually really want to do this because I feel like it's important to the storyline of the costuming. Okay. Um, and so I would put this dress late 1400s. We can see like um, a lot of like in the frescas and things that are very similar to the late 1400s clothing. This becomes a really important detail, I feel like, in like the costuming, which I will tie back in later for you. Yeah, I... One of the things that I really liked about this dress is it kind of felt to me like, I think she's meant to be like 19 in the film. And it kind of mm -hmm. felt to me like, this is probably like a nicer dress that she got when she was like, like a, a nice dress that she got when she was like 15 or something, but she's been wearing it consistently. Um, mm -hmm. And so I don't, I didn't feel like it was meant to be like, you know, the height of fashion, a new dress. It's just meant to be a dress that she's had around and worn. And I yeah. feel like, um, because it does have quite a a fashionable cut in the sense that the way the bodice like has that that cut in the front I don't know what that's called but you know what I mean like the a laced front a lace bit at the front and has like a yeah yes I know what you're talking about that scene um not necessarily I think they're the Milan portraits where you see that tie detail right. yeah so with that kind of detail I just thought you know this could have been like, cause she definitely looks, even in that work dress, she definitely looks more dressed up than the other sort of house mm -hmm. uh, people. So it's a nice, I, I don't know, obviously don't know if that was the intention, but I yeah. feel like we can imagine that this was a dress she had. Okay, so question. <laughs> do you think that that was a dress that Danielle had? Or do you think that was a dress that Danielle inherited from her mother? Ooh, from her mother. Oh, that would make sense with your timeline, right? Because... Yeah. Yeah. I wonder about... Like, they don't talk a lot about her mother at all. Well, so the breathe dress is about the same time period oh. as her work dress, when everyone else is a decade ahead. Ahead. <gasps> so it would make sense... I love that it. instead of Rod Milla like buying Danielle a new dress, she's just like, well, here's this thing I found in the attic. Yes. It should oh my fit. God. Oh, I'm so excited for us to talk about the brief dress. We're getting there. We're getting there, guys. <laughs> okay, next one. I have it down called as the court dress. She goes into the studio. Into the studio. And she wears that dress that's just hung up there. And I found it so cool because that is a thing that artists did all the time was they just had a set number of dresses that they had for paintings um, mm -hmm. and it's so nice because in the film it actually has a painting in the background wearing the dress so I thought that oh, was Oh really I never cool. noticed that! How did I not notice that? Yeah! The lady in the painting is wearing the same dress as hung up and then she then wears. This dress, um, I don't know much about like northern Italy, southern Germany other than like they're called the Burgundian style mm -hmm. um, and that's very much what this dress reminded me of as well as most of Rod Miller's dresses. I was thinking about how because this is meant to be a rich enough dress that when mm -hmm. she goes into the court she doesn't look out of place. Mm -hmm. But I she still looks out of place. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought it was quite effective uh, because obviously the fabrics is really what sets it apart um, because it has the brocades and, you know, um, brocade. And the train. Yes. That train yeah. in the wind as she's like <laughs> running away. Yeah. Anyway. So for a little bit of context, like brocades were hella expensive. Um, mm -hmm. They were very time consuming to make uh, and they were, I think, mostly silk. Uh, at that point in time, and Italy was a great producer of silk. Obviously, this is set in France. France also becomes a really good producer of silk, but it's a little bit later on. 
And so brocades were like really expensive fabrics to get. So like if you get a dress with lots of brocade, it means you're rich, basically. And so this dress has, what, two types of brocade at some point? Oh, it has a little, yeah. And then she's got the, the golden pearl hair neck. Snoot. I almost put on mine this morning. Like, so I get it. It has the same sleeves as her work dress and the brief dress, which would date it earlier, which like plays really well into my theory for the costuming. Um, but it's not really a memorable dress. And I think it's because this isn't a very memorable part of the story. Mm. It's just a thing that happened it's like the jumping off point. But I also that, like, felt it's... like it makes sense because when you look, there's a couple of shots in this scene where they show you the rest of the court and there's mm -hmm. like a bunch of ladies just walking around. And her dress just looks very similar to the other dresses, which means that it works. It's in the court setting. But I think as a viewer for the main character, it's not like that memorable a dress. Not compared to yeah. the other ones because I feel like there's such standout dresses in this film. Yeah. <laughs> that this one I would is agree. Kind of... <laughs> This one's kind of, you know. The next dress is the, I call it the library dress, but I think it's called, it's when, she, when they go to the monastery. Yes. This is straight like 1530s. 1530s specifically. Yeah. So you're looking at like 1520 to 1530. You can tell by the uh, leg of mutton sleeve. So 1520 to 1530 is when you start getting like a leg of mutton kind of sleeve. Right. I would say that they took an artistic detail by like moving that into two separate puffs. I haven't seen that in any of the portraiture. Okay. Um, but it fits with like the character. I also, I think my favorite part of this dress is like you know when Marguerite and Rod Miller are like going through all the dresses to figure out what to wear to like see Henry they pull out this dress Marguerite is like oh it's blue well Henry loves it's blue, blue. Oh, but yes. every other girl will be wearing it and like this is when I'm pretty sure this is like the exact moment when Marguerite would have been wearing that dress if she had chosen it but instead it's just there for Danielle to throw on. I hadn't even I love how they keep doing that like the dresses keep showing up even if they're not worn mm -hmm. they're like on hand that just makes them feel much more like clothes rather than you know a costume. Um, yeah. Yeah I really like this dress you know I think this is a much nicer dress than the one we were just talking about. And I agree with the sleeves bit. I think the sleeves actually really work in setting it apart. But I was just looking at the bodice and the bodice actually really reminds me of the style of her work dress. Um, yes. Her work dress, which is also blue. And then this blue dress for Henry. I don't know, I just feel like that was- But it's a blue and silver dress. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we're going from a blue work dress to a blue and silver dress when they fall in love to the silver brief gown. Wow, that's so cool. Oh, um, be we've already kind of touched on this, but like because she borrowed it from Marguerite, mm -hmm. it definitely fits with like the Mar Marguerite and Jacqueline dresses and which will be a trend for like the next few. Yes, I was thinking the same thing because I noticed that uh, Marguerite has big sleeves. Like all of her mm -hmm. dresses have much bigger sleeves the next dress, I called it a velvet gown, but it's, ah, oh, it's what I would make if I was making a dress from this. This it's, is the um the one that they go to the garden in, right? Uh, yeah, or the ruins? The, the ruins, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like yeah. A, a red velvet, um, like a deep red velvet. I love this yeah. color, like burgundy, whatever, like you know, like that deep, deep oh, mm -hmm. velvet. It's just, just yummy. So delicious. If, if fabric can be delicious. And I think this is meant to be one of Marguerite's dresses as well. It's either Marguerite or Jacqueline. Oh, Jacqueline. Um, they solely costume Jacqueline in green, though. Mm. Um, and then Marguerite is in orange and red. So it would make more sense if this was Marguerite's dress. Um, it almost it has a similar shape to the one that she wears to the tennis match, but the sleeves are different. That's just what I was thinking, that the sleeves are different from that one. Um, but again, with this kind of style, sleeves can be interchangeable. Um, yeah. Which makes dresses really versatile, doesn't it? Well, and if you think about it, like fashion changed in, so we're talking like from 1480 to like 1600, fashion changed about every 10 to 20 years. Um, but like the 
silhouette and the shape of the bodice didn't really change other than possibly a neckline. What changed was the shape of the sleeves. Yes. Um, and so it would make sense on how like they're interchanging these sleeves to better suit characters um, in like different ways. But from an a, economical point of view as well, that means you have one dress, but you can have different mm -hmm. looks uh, in the same dress because you just need to change the sleeves. And it's just such a good, just a good way to do it. Why don't we do that anymore? I think we've come to it, Marty. This is it. Have we come to the dress? We've Have come we to come it. to the dress? <laughs> I love how we're <laughs> celebrating this. Okay. Um, so we already kind of talked about how this dress is very similar in construction to um, her work dress, but also very similar to like the court dress, right? Yeah. It's kind of like a happy medium between the two, um, which makes me think that like, yeah, should I, should I tell this like theory that I have been teasing yes. all video? Okay. Let's have it. Okay, so my theory um, about the story that was told through costuming is we see Danielle go through this process of like, here I am in this like, we'll call it what it is, an abusive situation, but she's still herself. She's still Danielle. Um, and then when she goes on these adventures as Nicole, she's wearing someone else's clothes, which means that like she's not being herself. And so this is the first time when we really see Danielle being Danielle in front of the prince. And that's why like the visual cues that we have been given mm -hmm. through, this is the work dress and this is Danielle. And then this is the court dress and this is Danielle sliding into Nicole. And then Nicole being with the prince, right? Um, and then like the breeze dress is just, she's just like, here, it's me. I'm sparkly, look at me, this is my true self. And like, I just, I love this moment so much because it's like through the costume story, we know instantly, whether we recognize it or not, that this is her in her full power, her as her true self, um, which also makes like her getting outed by her stepmother, like so much more heartbreaking because it's just yeah. like, how cruel do you have to be to like take this moment, this glorious moment from someone and basically like literally rip her wings off. Yes. I thought that was such a clever use. Cause you know, in Cinderella, they like, um, they rip her mother's dress, mm -hmm. her, the, the, the pink dress, they rip it, but then she gets the transformation, but this is post transformation. This is yeah. already the like the final final evolution. It's the dress, yeah. and the, she rips off the wing, which technically is like a Leonardo da Vinci construction. So it's not actually part of her mother's legacy, but yeah. it's still literally so literally that action of clipping her wings so she can't leave the abusive household. Is and then she gets sold into a more abusive one. Oh, I'm just I can't. Ah, oh. so gross, so gross. Let's get back to the breeze dress. <laughs> okay, let, let's talk about pretty things. <laughs> yeah, it's just stunning. It's just stunning. I just, the amount of texture, the amount mm -hmm. of detail, the amount of different trims has been a freaking nightmare. Um, but it's just so beautiful and it all works so well together. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and it's like, it's definitely a costume piece. Like you look at that and you're like, that's costume. But it's just so well done in the time, like in context of like the costume story as well as like the actual story. Yeah. Um, it's just like, you just, you can't, you can't not like it. I still buy it basically. <laughs> like yeah. it doesn't ruin, it doesn't get you out of the moment. And I feel like that's a really good sign of good costume design is that you, it keeps you, every time you see a new costume, if it keeps you in the mood in the scene, then th they, good job, that's it, that's, that's all. Yeah. <laughs> And there's just there's just such good build up for the breeze dress. It's just mm -hmm. outstanding because they bring it out once and like they bring it out twice, I think, before it, she actually put, even puts it on. And it's yeah. when they first are like, oh, look, this dress, you wear it, Marguerite, because it's like it's better than anything that they have in their wardrobes. So mm -hmm. already there's that setup of this dress is mind blowing. And then yeah. Marguerite tries to get it again. And then when um Danielle finally puts it on and she goes to the carriage. It's like there's a sneak peek of her hem as she gets into the carriage, there's a sneak peek of the shoes.
And the other thing I wanted to look into, but I actually forgot to, duh, is that there's the whole like a uh, early modern uh, cult of like you know like the sort of imagery of the moon in like um, that sort of you know like Artemis moon queen fairy yeah, queen kind of vibe. That's definitely what they did, right? Because with the pearls as well, like there's lots of pearls in the dress, and I feel like that's a really good early modern. I mean, it's a bit later than this, uh, but it's like playing on that sort of early modern imagery. Ah, oh, it's just good decisions all around for this film, I think. <laughs> yeah. So the last dress is the um, her princess dress, we'll call mm -hmm. it. Um, and so that is in the same style as her court dress. Yeah, that's one of the things I noticed about the film. It's like the actual cut of the dresses aren't very different, but it plays mm -hmm. on fabric and layers that makes the, in sleeves, go back to sleeves. Sleeves. That changes the whole look. So mm -hmm. I feel like they've done that really, really well. Um, keeps them all sort of connected as well. Such a powerful moment. And then she shows up in this like very royal looking, cause she's finally dressed in the same colors as um, like the king and queen are dressed in like reds and golds the entire movie. Um, and so you see Danielle appear in this red and this gold, but also in a cut and a silhouette that matched her work dress. And it's just very empowering to see this, like her presenting of like, I will speak for you. Yeah. You will like think of me every day. Like I forget what the line is, but uh, it's really well done. Like I like visually, you can see the entire storyline through the costumes. And like, like, that's what I love. But I'll just say thank you so much, Marty, for coming on the channel and talking about this. Um, mm -hmm. And if you guys are interested in more Ever After content, we will have a second half over in Marty's channel at some point. And that is it. I hope you guys had a good time hanging out with me and Marty. Uh, again, this wasn't meant to be a historical nitpicking video at all. We're just enjoying these costumes and also enjoying our love of history and putting them together and also trying to trace and see the thoughts behind the historical designer and, you know, all the makers. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. I love this film. I love the costumes. I'm, I'm, hopefully, hopefully the next time you hear me say the words ever after it is regarding some sort of finished piece of the breeze dress. <laughs> Stay tuned.